Oh my gosh, lots of lots of familiar faces from the workshop crowd to the project crowd. This is great. Tony, I like the beard. That's awesome. Looks yep, looks good. Looks really good. Bill, of course, the beard just gets more and more impressive every every single time. David, <laughs> Dennis, Al, Bob. Somebody's got audio on YouTube. There we go. We got audio on YouTube. Somebody's got audio on. Norm. Oh, hey, both you guys. That might be me. Nice to see you. Carl, Ron, Gary, hey, Ron. Jim. Who's got audio on YouTube? Oh, oh, I hear somebody's uh, audio is on with the, with the delay from YouTube going there. Is that you, Woody? It was me. We're good. Hi, yeah. Woody. You know, just so people can see, there's there's the speaker view, and anybody who's new to this, there's also the the um, gallery view up at the top. If you hit that gallery view, you can kind of see everybody. It's totally you can switch back and forth if you're not so used to using uh, Zoom. It's kind of a handy handy trick um, for anybody that we've got that's new in the Zoom meeting. We we keep everybody muted except uh, Rick, Darren, Woody, and I. Unless, you know, we have a question where we pull somebody in, just otherwise having 50 people talk at once gets ridiculous and, and nobody can nobody can hear anything. Um, but today it's mainly just Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the I'll, I'll answer a few questions. We had some stuff about the Z6 II and I know not everybody's here night is Nikon, so we won't focus a whole ton on it, but I'll put out a few little thoughts. Um, and uh, Woody, you got any anything to put out? I uh, don't. We talked about next week uh, or next in two weeks from from today, December 1st, having a, another photo submission. But I'll let you guys talk about that. Otherwise, uh, all of these sessions are viewable on YouTube afterwards. So if you go to YouTube and uh, slash Hudson Henry Photography, I believe uh, you can you can find the past live sessions. They're also linked up on the website on the uh, office hours page. And I think that's it. Just yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. And remember, there's the chat window too here for anybody that you can still, everybody can communicate and ask questions and we'll be watching that. Plus we've got all the questions that you submitted. Rick, anything you want to talk about? We should probably talk a little bit about submissions for the December 1st photo yeah. critique. I figured it's probably time to do another photo critique. And given that we're back, most of the country is back in quarantine, lockdown, as well as Europe and many other parts of the world, we thought we'd do another sort of photo contest that sort of talks about, as we enter into the holidays, it's gonna be quite different from last year. So what, you know, when you think about taking a shot, you know, what sort of does this year's holiday say to you? You know, so I think just go out, shoot, So some image that that talks about how, yeah, I think it would be great. You know, I mean, the 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 submissions are sort of open, but if if I think the great assignment would be to this is a strange holiday, I think for most of us, uh, probably a lot less family interaction and social activity than we're used to at the holiday season. So if we can come up with an image that sort of speaks to us about how how we're all affected in this holiday season, that'd be that'd be pretty great so one image per person and we'll have the the um the guidelines set up when you go to register i don't know how, how soon will that be up woody uh see probably i could have it up in the next day so probably okay. by the end of the day today or tomorrow okay cool all right so um i know we had i'm going to just preempt a number of questions that we had about the z6 i'll do it kind of quick um, a lot of people are concerned because they can't download and work on their raw files uh, in Adobe. Om um, One supports them, but they don't look great yet. They're going to have to work with their kind of sauce on how it interprets those raw files. It always takes a little while for new cameras uh, to get support from Adobe. And the way I generally deal with it uh, after having gone through it a whole bunch of times now is I just shoot high quality JPEG plus raw. Um, large high quality JPEG plus raw and you know enjoy those those JPEGs until Adobe does the update where it supports the raw files and then if you have some images that you're really excited about going through and really highly editing we'll then import those raw files and work on them sort of you know in a couple of weeks from now 
for now, just enjoy, just enjoy the JPEG uh, shooting. There's been a lot of people, uh, probably people moving from DSLR <coughs> over to mirrorless for the first time who've been asking about settings and things like that. And, and I'm cranking out a course for OM1 that's gonna launch on, on Black Friday as part of a big photo kit. And Rick's helping me with an ebook that's accompanying that. But I, I will, in the next couple of days, record a complete setup guide for the Z62 and Z72. And I'll put that out on YouTube and it'll go through the menus and I'll have the menus lit up so you can follow along. Um, and I'll do that. I'll do that sooner than later. So just look for that. Um, I think there was another question, firmware. That's an interesting thing. Uh, there's a firmware update for the camera already, which is sort of surprising. Um, but there's also, I, I ran into a situation. I went out to test autofocus at the wildlife refuge day before yesterday and took my kids and was doing kind of the auto tour route at Ridgefield wildlife refuge in the van. And when I went to connect my 500 PF lens, I think David had mentioned this to me, but I forgot about it or somebody mentioned it to me. And, and I got out there and I connected up the 500 PF lens on the Z62 and it gave me a, a message that the, FTZ adapter needed a firmware update to work with the Z62. And I had no way to do that out in the middle of nowhere in the wildlife refuge. So I was kind of stuck shooting with my 70 to 200, which most of the time I was there might as well have been a 50 millimeter. <laughs> you know, it was just way too small for, for how far away the birds in flight were. Um, so just make sure that you, you check your FTZ adapter and update that firmware if you're shooting older lenses. And also some of the older lenses might need a firmware update. You probably have to update the FTZ adapter and then update them through the system. I think that's kind of it on the, on the Z cameras. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's autofocus is massively improved and it's fun to not worry about the buffer at all when you're shooting action. Um, and they'll, you know, we'll take more of that stuff later. Is that all the questions really that cover most of what we, what people ask? Yeah. About, yeah. Okay. When when is this? When are you supposed to get the, the Z72? Mm, next month. And I'll be honest, okay. I'm not completely sure I'm going to keep it. I'll, I'll review it and I'll play around with it a little bit. But um, for me, you know, if I'm shooting sports and action or motion, generally I don't need 46 megapixel files. Um, I I mostly would reach for the Z6 in those situations. Uh, and the big improvement is speed handling and autofocus. And the Z7 to me feels more like a, you know, it's to make those masterpiece crafted images where you're on the tripod and you're mostly using manual settings and manual focus. And because the image quality isn't really any better, I, I don't know that I would, I, I think the Z6 II would, would takes advantage of a lot of what's updated. We'll see, I'll, I'll tell you what I think yeah. once I get it and once I've worked with the Z6 II more, but that's my take right now is I'd rather save that money and wait for whatever the big new pro mirrorless is that'll be coming next year. We'll see. Um, but the Z62, I'm not giving back. I love it. So. so there was one other just sort of small thing to mention. Um, we've got, I know we've got a bunch of on one users out here. Um, on one kind of screwed up in the first race of photo raw this fall and, and messed up the clone stamp tool. Um, and mm -hmm. They put out a bunch of updates yesterday, a bunch of new standalones. They also put out a new version <clears throat> of Photo Raw, I think it's .01, um, that brings back the old clone stamp and it works exactly the way it does. And the new healing brush now has a clone option. So those of you who are upset about the changes, you can be happy that they listened and they listened pretty quickly. So. Yeah, I, uh, I was, I was like, you. They can't seriously be changing it that way. I'm glad yeah, they went well, out. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of random questions. I mean, you know, you know just from all over the map. Um, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull these. I, I tried to, to sort them thematically, but they they really are everywhere. Um, <laughs> well, while so, you sort it. We did well, have I've one got, no, question. I got it sorted. I was going to start, but you, what, what do you got? Well, I just saw Rob asked in the chat about what about converting raw files to DNG. And at this point, the Adobe DNG converter doesn't support yeah. the file either. Um, and I'm just not a giant DNG fan. To me, you know, it only takes a couple of weeks. <clears throat> I generally do JPEG plus raw and hold those raws back till I can, till I can work with them. But whatever. I can say 
vaguely enough that I don't violate anything, but Adobe is pretty close on the Z2 file format. <clears throat> I would imagine actually by the time the Z72 is out, all of this will be a distant memory. Cool. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, just because it it's come up a couple of times already, have you gotten uh, or are you looking at getting the uh, the Z teleconverters at all? Uh, I I have been talking with my good friend Charlie, who has the 1.4. Uh, I kind of am waiting for the 1.7, which I know is a ways away. Um, I want to I want to. He's going to do some tests for me. Um, I've kind of given him a few instructions. He's driving today. That's the only reason he's not here. But he's going to do some tests with the 70 to 200 and send me some files so that we can look side by side. Um, but the, but the, what I'm hearing so far and what I'm seeing from other reviews are it's, you know, kind of like usual, the 2.0 is probably more made for the big top gun primes that are coming. Uh, it, you lose a little image quality with the 70 to 200. It just can't resolve quite that well, but the 1.4 seems just about perfect. Um, yeah, I, I, I probably, it, I will either get the 1.4 or the 1.7. I'm just waiting for the 1.7 to try it first. So um, actually, this might be a good a good segue. Uh, David Ply asked a question about options for selling old gear as <laughs> as people move from this to that. And it's a great question. It's a really great question, um, and it's and it's asked of the correct person. I might add, I've been after well, Hudson I for years to do a a thing on buying and selling off of eBay. Yeah, I've sold and, and purchased quite a few items off of eBay and, and had really, really good luck with it, as long as you're really careful. And I, I have a whole bunch of things I need to sell. They've been backing up while I've been busy with work. Uh, and I'm planning in the next couple of weeks to actually photograph and sell a bunch of stuff that I have laying around here. And I think I'll make a YouTube video about it. But to me, the key is clean your, clean your stuff really, really well. Um, always think ahead. I keep all the boxes for my big items that I know I'm eventually going to want to sell like bodies and lenses and flashes. Um, and so you've got the original materials, you know, I, I never use the little straps that come with the cameras, but I keep them in their packages and you lay all that stuff out. You photograph it well on a white seamless backdrop. Uh, you light it well, you make it look really good. You make sure you show every angle of it. Um, and, and, you know, just, just treat your buyers with care and respect and you'll develop a good reputation for selling on eBay. There, you know, there are other options. You can do consignment things through a local camera store. Um, you can do trade-in stuff with B&H, but I think you get more money generally selling it on eBay yourself if you have the time. Um, when it comes to purchasing on eBay, you want to really look at that seller's reputation and make sure that there aren't people uh, saying that they've been bait and switched or that there's some problem with delivery. Uh, and you want to make sure that they have fantastic photos and that they write a history that's real, not just something that they copied off of B&H's website and threw up. You want at least a couple paragraphs of their description of their experience with the product so you know that they're, they're real. Um, and that's, that's my biggest advice for buying and selling off of eBay. I'm usually pretty wary about buying camera bodies off of eBay. And the reason is that they're such sophisticated little computers these days. You know, you don't know what's gone on. You don't know if they've had some hit and they're malfunctioning in some way. You know, they can look great in the photos. Um, lenses and optics, you can get a pretty good idea from looking at them, whether they've been treated carefully or not. Um, and, you know, a good seller will really show you the glass in a way that you can yeah. see the front and back and make sure that there's no problems there and they'll describe it really well. So, yeah, I've, I've sold quite a bit <clears throat> of glass and bought a couple off of eBay. And I would agree. The most important is seller reputation and the quality of the photographs. You know, if I look at someone selling a lens and you know, there's two cruddy phone photos that, you know, haven't even been edited. One of them's out of focus. It's like next. You know. Yep. Yeah. And the other, uh, the other thing about that reputation uh, point is you want to look at how, how, how long is that history on eBay? 
you know, I think I've been selling on eBay since 2000. So it's like a 20 year history with hundred percent feedback. So anybody that looks at me on eBay knows, well, this guy's hasn't cheated anyone in 20 years. And, you know, you can kind of get it a gauge if someone's got, you know, five hit feedback history over the last two months and they joined in 2020, you're like, Hmm, I wonder if they created a new identity because they had a problem with the last one. You know, it's the, those kinds of read between the lines yeah. on that. Tony, Tony Roberts said that he's thought about passing on equipment to local schools who may have clubs, that type of thing. I've done that with printers in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if you can, if you can do it, that's great. Yeah. Um, and sometimes gear, the, the value is depreciated to the point where you're not going to get that much out of it anyway. And someone else could really use it. I think yeah. that's a great idea, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch nice. of my old bodies and stuff have gone to, cousins and nephews and that sort of stuff who you know are shooting with their phone and they want something else so. yeah absolutely uh, let's see here um we had uh, chris taylor had some had sort of uh, questions about uh buying and maintaining a printer um mm -hmm. You know, so from what I understand, you get better quality with inkjet versus laser, which is absolutely true. Um, and with more ink cartridges versus fewer. Um, but every inkjet printer I've seen has problems with things coming up if not used at least every couple of days. Um, I, I, I'm actually in the midst of working on a book about inkjet printers and fine art photo printing. Um, you know, the the photo printer market is sort of split into two, sort of inkjet or pigment and dye based printers. Um, dye printers tend to be a little bit more vibrant in their color and they don't clog as much as pigment based printers. But in the last decade, things have changed quite a bit. Um, I had a lot of problems with clogs back in the early 2000s, but not so much anymore. Um, you know, Hudson and I have been running printers for, I, I don't know how long. I've been actually been reviewing photo printers, color inkjet printers since the late eighties. So, um, you know, the thing is, is that if you don't use a printer, even a dye printer, it's gonna, it's gonna clog. And one of the things that I tell people to do is just run a couple of four by sixes of, of photos, you know, through your printer every couple of weeks. And for the most part, you'll be fine. Um, Unless you let it sit for six to eight months, even if it does get a head clog, it's a tiny amount of ink. It's a, it's a tiny amount of ink in the grand scheme of things. I, I find that the big 9900 here in the studio, the Epson, it, if I haven't run it for three weeks or a month, if I run a normal cleaning routine, one normal cleaning routine, which doesn't use that much ink, everything's perfect. If yeah. I don't, usually there's one or two colors that aren't coming through. But I mean, I think once a month you run a couple print. Every two weeks you run a couple prints, you're going to be great. If you run a cleaning process once a month, you'll be fine. And it doesn't use that much ink. So, yeah, I think, you know, the thing about photo printing, if you want a printer, is that you have to want to print. Um, yeah. You know, if you're just going to print a little bit here and there, you're better off using one of the online services. They do great. If you run a, you know, even semi-calibrated system, you know, your printers will come out, your pr prints will come out the way you want them to. I mean, printing is, I mean, uh, not to sound pretentious, but I mean, it's an art form. It, it truly, yes. truly is. And you've got to want to do that. Um, and that means, you know, buying special paper and all that sort of stuff. Um, the one thing that, that, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have said you buy a pigment based printer. Um, and I think in the last 10 years, I would say that's changed. Um, you buy a pigment based ink jet if you want the finest quality and the longest lasting prints. Um, you know, if I'm selling my work or I'm putting it on a gallery wall or something like that, there's no way I'm going to use a dye based printer. Um, yeah. That said, Die, the, the Canon and ink and Epson die based, you know, the ones with eight inks are wonderful. They, they create beautiful prints 
And if you put them, you know, under glass, they're going to last a long time. They're not going to fade, you know, like they did in the, the early 2000s. You know, literally you could leave a print out and, and a week afterwards, you know, a dye based print would be faded. Um, so don't get hung up on all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I'd have to echo for anybody who's just thinking about getting, you know, thinks that, oh, I'll get a printer and I'll be able to make beautiful prints myself easily. It, Rick's completely right. It's a whole nother discipline. Um, and it, it requires, it requires studying just as much as making good images and editing good, editing good images does. It's a whole nother can of worms that you're opening up and it's a fun exciting rewarding engaging pursuit but just don't think of it as something that's going to be easy um, yeah it, 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 it's surprisingly difficult to get good at but you know i mean I, I remember rick's been doing it longer than i have i got into it probably in about 2002 2003 i got pretty serious about printing uh and and i've used a bunch of different printers from canon to to hp to epson uh, and it's, it's very rewarding. It isn't necessarily cost effective, uh, unless you do a lot yeah. of it. Uh, and unless you have a larger printer that has the bigger ink tanks, which cost a fortune, but last a very long time. Uh, the, the smaller consumer printers have such small print, uh, ink that the little cartridges are so ridiculously expensive. It's like the most expensive liquid on earth. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of that stuff has changed. I, I mean, in yeah. the, you know, in the early 2000s, Epson and Canon and HP were coming out with new printers every couple of years. Now we're getting new pigment-based printers every five years. Um, yeah. I've got Epson's brand new P900, which shipped about a month and a half ago. I'm working on a review of that. Canon's got a new pigment-based printer. Um, they don't change as much as they used to. And the companies have gotten a little bit smarter about the whole ink tank thing. Um, so I'll say this, I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, it's rick at completedigitalphotography.com. Um, I have been sending out a, an email that's a couple pages long about if you want to get into printing, what is it all about? What do you, what should you think about? I'm happy to send that to anyone. So again, rick at completedigitalphotography.com. Just send me a note and put, I want that printer thing and I'll send it out to you guys. And just to give everyone a heads up, Rick and I were, were talking pretty seriously about doing some smaller print workshops locally here in the Northwest before the whole pandemic thing shifted everything this year. So, and I think we still want to do that in the future. We just need a, a little bit safer time to do it. Um, and I think we're going to work on some, yeah. some printing training together um, and it'll be, yeah. it'll be fun. To, so. And, and, and I, I'm completely honest about, I mean, the online printing services today, I mean, are great. I think Hudson and I both agree that Bay Photo is probably our favorite, but mm -hmm. MPix does a good job. I mean, yeah. there's so many out there that do a, that will create great prints. They're easy to upload. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, Costco even does a good job at printing. I mean, they've got profiles and they tell you how to print and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. you know, no matter how you want to do it, whether you want to actually go out and invest in a printer or just start printing your stuff online, do it because it, it's such it's such an important part of photography. And it's one that with, you know, small screens and Instagram and all this sort of stuff, it's like it, I'm, I'm worried that it's it's it, it's getting lost to the, the current generation of photographers. I mean, there's nothing yeah. like holding a print in your hand, nothing like it. I, I happened upon uh, Bay Photo years ago. I was up at Delicate Arch one night. It's kind of a funny story, just you know, to take a side trip for a second since it's a Q and A session here. And um, I, I, I took two camera bodies, two tripods, a whole bunch of gear up there that night. It wasn't a workshop. Uh, it was just me going up there. Actually, I had Blake Rudis with me. And I got up there and there was this really sweet Japanese guy, photographer who was sort of cursing at his camera body. And I asked him what was wrong. And he's, he didn't speak great English, but it became clear that his D750 wasn't working. And I happened to have a D750 in my bag that I was planning on using for time-lapse. And I just 
had him put his memory card in my camera and use it for the evening because he'd hiked all the way up there. And there was this person who heard the whole thing and afterwards came up to me and said he, he was one of the people, big, big wigs at Bay Photo. And he thought it was so sweet that I'd done that for that guy and, uh, and just offered to do a bunch of free printing for me. And I was so impressed with their stuff. And then I've developed a little relationship with them. Uh, and and I'm, I'm happy to recommend them. They're really, really nice people and they do great work. And if you want to try out metal printing, they do a great job with metal yeah. prints. And I love the fact that they have semi-gloss and satin finishes where they don't have that high reflectivity where every light in the house just glares off it and you can't see through it. I think their semi-gloss is really fantastic. So I, I'm happy yeah. to re recommend those guys. They're good people. Anywho. Yeah. Well, that's hey. enough about printing. <laughs> do you guys do yep. anything to protect your prints from fading? Just throw it under glass or do you do anything specific beyond that? Rick, you go and then I'll tell. Um, I, I frame a lot of work um, and I rotate in and out. I, you know, I don't, I don't leave the same things on the wall all the time. Um, I'm actually in the process right now of rotating out a bunch of prints. Um, you know, I have, I store them in a drawer, you know, a big, file drawer. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not super worried about anything that I'm doing unless it's going in a gallery. Um, you know, Hudson. Well, I'm really enamored for, for quite a while now um, with not using a frame or glass at all. I really like to, to either, you know, get my prints made on metal or do my own print and have it mounted on on you know either Sintra board if it's smaller that's kind of a, a plastic it's almost like PVC it's solid core and it holds up really well up to maybe 24 by 36 and then if it's going even bigger something like ultra board like this print back here you can take it you know you do your own print or have it done for you and take it to a local lamination shop and they'll do a perfect job putting it on that board and cutting the edges perfectly and then I spray it with this product called Art Shield. You know, I'll put it up on a summer day and just give it two thin coats of this Art Shield. And that seals it from water, protects it from UV, and lets you wipe it off with a damp microfiber cloth. It just makes it really, really resilient. And then, you know, I either will build a little wooden frame and gorilla glue it to the back of that so that it floats off the wall, or just put 3M Command, that kind of high-tech, Velcro you can that that's removable once you put it on something you just put a couple pieces on there peel the back off and push it up against the wall and they just float right off the wall and they look beautiful and kind of modern and for me it's it's you know it's all about the image and I don't want anything to distract from it I kind of you know and I find that good glass that doesn't have glare is so ridiculously expensive it winds up being more expensive than having a print made or the ink and paper and time that goes into making your print I just I just love having it just float off the wall. So that's what I, I do with that. I don't, I, um, I, I still like seeing a, a frame and, and decent glass. Um, you know, uh, Jim Bridger asked if did anyone use Fracture, which uh, is a company that, that does prints on glass. Um, and I've used them a bunch. Uh, some of the, some of the stuff that <clears throat> they've done for me has been beautiful. It's pricey. Um, what I would do if you want to test it out is, um, go to their website and when the pop-up comes, you know, give them your email address and you get, I think 25% off, 15% off your first order. Um, I've done a few, but again, I, I find, you know, I want to, I want to print my work the way I want to print it. Um, and that's using very specific paper types and mm -hmm. at, certain sizes and, you know, and I'll invest in the nice glass for a great print, um, you know. Yeah, I just I mean, don't like the glass anymore. I know, and, I know. And, and that's right, and, and, that, and, that, yeah. and, and, and your work, especially because you print it so big is magnificent like that, um, you know. I think that, you know, it's one of the cool things about having your own printer is that you can, you can spend a lot of time sort of going off into these worlds of paper types and all that sort of stuff, so. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a while where Art Wolf was doing these crazy things in his gallery, I used to go in Seattle all the time where it was just a beautiful piece of matte board and then he'd ha he would 
tear the paper. He was using this really nice fine art paper and he'd tear the edges. So it was a rough edge and just float it on a nice matte board under yeah. glass. That was cool. You know, there's all kinds of different ways to do things. Yeah. Those you guys haven't mentioned canvas. Oh yeah. I'm not a giant canvas fan, Rick. I'm not a canvas fan either. But but again, you know, it's not it, it it's what you like in a print. Exactly. You know, Hudson and I are very different. Hudson loves that luster finished paper. You know, he just absolutely adores it. And it's like I've come to the place where pretty much all I want to print on now is fine art paper. You know, and it, it's you know some of it's getting the the images you want to look the way you want them to is really what it comes down to. You know, I would never tell anyone that that canvas sucks or glossy paper sucks or any of that sort of stuff. That's, you know, one of the wonderful things about printing on your own is again, is it, that you get one more dimension in the photo editing process that a lot of us don't normally get, which is looking at something off of paper versus off of your screen. It's a completely different experience and you see things differently. Yeah. You know? And, you know, we'll talk about editing for the print and that's a very real thing. That's a very real thing. So it's it's just you've got to want to do it. I mean, you know, uh, you know, when we talk about you know being a photographer, you know, there's some people who the thing they love most is being in the field. There are other people who the thing they love most is sitting in front of the computer and doing the editing. You know, there's other people who love the print the most. You know, that's yeah. My friend Ben, you know, he could care less about the first two parts. He just wants to get to the print. You know, I'm kind <laughs> of in that place but you know i'm not as out as far as he is so i it's you know printing is wonderful i think hudson and i want to do some more stuff with with folks in the in a workshop type setting about printing because it's it's just great it is it's a really really rewarding pursuit i you know um <laughs> you, i'm definitely and, the guy that I like being out in the field, but <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I just say, I did Jack, because it's like, I can already see eyes blazing over in the zoom, okay. in the zoom window, right. you know, yeah, enough printing yeah. is pr printing is, is, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. All right. But actually this is a, this is a nice segue. Jim Bridger asked about uh, you and Rick often mentioned that a picture is over-processed mm. as someone who has uses on one calibrated screen to post-process. Is this observation just personal taste or are there guidelines that are helpful in determining what's over or not? Wow, it's a, um, it, it's very subjective. Let's just be honest about it. It's kind of like that, that Supreme Court pornography decision that's so famous where you know the, the, you know it when you see it. What's art, what's pornography, what's over-processed versus what's not and you know there are people who love the look of an overprocessed image and there was a there was a period of time there in kind of the dawn of the automated hdr processing where that was all the rage everything looked electric and neon and was you know glowing off the screen that was never personally my thing i like a lot of color i like deep blacks and, and bright highlights, which is one of the reasons why I like a luster paper more than more than matte paper for most purposes um, when we we're talking about printing. But I, you know, I <laughs> had to get that in, I, did you? At the same time, <laughs> well, there are things that I think lend themselves well mm. to each. Um, yeah, no, I don't. You know, the kind, of, the kind of photography that I tend to do, I think you want a broad dynamic range. Yeah. But yep. the, um, the, uh, the point about process to me, you know, my whole photographic philosophy is, is, is probably, it doesn't need to be anybody else's, but for me, I'm always about capturing the best representation of that beautiful moment that I find out in nature. It's kind of like hunting without the brutal part. You know, I'm, I'm out after something and sometimes I don't know exactly what I'm out after, but I find something, you know, that's interesting, or I'm out after something and I find something completely different. Uh, but I want to capture it as well as I possibly can in camera, come back and get that vision that I had right on my computer screen. And I still want it to look natural. You know, I don't, I don't want people to look at it and say, wow, it didn't really look like that. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I am after that 
that natural look. I want it to pop and be vibrant and contrasty, but I don't want, for me, for me, over-processed, you know, when I start to see crunchy edges in clouds, you know, if I start to see that there's kind of a halo glowing around the dark edges of clouds, if, if those contrast lines between light and shadow have kind of a, an afterglow where, you know, you can just tell there's a halo growing from that contrast line from over-processing. If the colors don't look like anything I've ever seen in the natural world, and you know, sometimes I capture an image, sometimes I'm out in a sunset where it truly is like that. And I bring it back and without any processing, I look at it and I think, huh, that just looks a little too much. I'll find myself toning nature yeah. down a little bit. The longer I've been doing this, the more I find myself pulling saturation to the left more than to the right. Um, yeah. So for me, it's, it's just taking the tools that we have to make an image pop and stand out and pushing it just a little too far to where the eye looks at it and it's like, that's not real. Um, and I think it is very subjective and it's going to depend on who's looking at the image. But I, I think that you'll find that over time, as you do this pursuit more and more, your eye probably is going to move away from the overprocessed look as well. And you'll start to recognize it more. I don't know what anybody else have a take on that. Darren said, you know, what was the number one comment we had in the fall photo critique? A little too much saturation. <laughs> um, and and, and I, 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 Hudson and I have actually been talking about this topic quite a bit recently, um, about how as we've gotten gone further and further in our photographic careers, we actually find ourselves being much less, we don't do a lot of cranking on sliders, especially things like dynamic contrast and sharpening and saturation and those types of things. And some of that's because of the way that, that we've evolved in our photography. Um, you know, I've seen some amazing images that are truly unreal, um, you know, where they are oversaturated and, you know, they just have this look that, that it, it's almost like another planet or a part of the planet you don't know. Um, and, and it, it all comes down to, first of all, you still have to have a good base to start with. You have to have a good photograph that's got decent dynamic range for, for the scene you, sh you captured. You know, the, the, the problem I see is that people use dynamic contrast and sharpening to make up for the fact that their images aren't sharp. And that's not gonna help. That actually makes your images look worse. Um, yeah. I also see, especially with on one, because they've got so many presets that do so many crazy things that they just apply a preset and then don't do much on top of that. Yeah. Um, I also think that people do too much global editing and not enough, you know, localized editing of, of an image, dodging and burning. You know, it amazes me sometimes to be in a workshop and talk to someone and bring up the words dodging and burning. And, and it's, it's like, they've never heard of that. And what, what is it? Um, and so I think it's just, you know, for, overdone is really when you use some of these filters and sliders to try and make up for the deficiencies in the base image. And part of your journey as a photographer is learning when an image is good enough that you want to work on it and when an image as much as you love it is not no matter no ma matter how much processing you do it's not going to make it a great image you know so david do you have any thoughts on this turd polishing comes to mind <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be honest. I've seen some really wonderful images that are that are a little over processed too. And and you yes. know, I, and all n none of us are are immune from this. Sometimes I edit late into the night and I'm bleary eyed, and I I look at it the next morning. I whoo, I was really overdoing it. You know, I'll come back and look at yeah. it again. And say, wow, I need to tone that down. And, and when I started out in my photography and was really you know starting to, to do better work and meeting up with other photographers who've been doing it for a long time. My friends, John and Eva come to mind, my, my National Geographic photographer friends. 
Um, you know, I had good images, but I was really heavy on the saturation. I came up, you know, shooting Velvia film and here's this opportunity to make things even more colorful than, than what I'd had before. And, you know, they would make comments, well, that's a lovely photo, a little bit colorful, you know, but uh, a lovely photo. And, you know, over time, I look back at those old images that I've edited and I'm like, whoa, wow, pull the saturation back, Hudson. You know, I mean, I think that it's an evolution for each and every one of us. And I've seen yeah. workshop students that started with me several years ago where I was making some of those comments. And then I look at their images today and I'm like, wow, spot on, looking good. You know, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's universal. I think it's something yeah. everybody goes through in their evolution. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I've been recently yeah. looking over some contest photos from our local Nature Photography Association. And, and the vast majority of them are, are just tragically overprocessed. Yeah. Well, and this is one of the things that we learn that, that we see a lot of when we do the critiques, you know, is that the, learning the language to be able to tell whether you have a good photograph to start with or not is, is a key thing that I think everyone has to learn as a photographer, you know, and that's separate from processing. Uh, that's a completely separate thing. You know, I, I, you know, it's not like everybody's images are, are, are bad. It's, you know, someone goes out in the field and they get this shot and they get back and they don't really look at what it looks like. They don't check the focus, but they're in love with that photo. And, and at some point you have to be able to step back and look at it and be able to say to yourself, is this a good photograph? And, and then you deal with the processing, you know? Um, and the photo itself is your spouse. Oh, go ahead, David. The photo itself is separate or needs to be separated from the nostalgia of the, the photo yeah. shoot and, and what it took to get that photo and, and how yeah, much fun yeah. you had and how warmly you remember it. Sometimes that plays too much into the photos. Yeah, we show exactly. And, exactly. And actually the photo itself. I, I, don't, I, I don't know how many times. There's been the, what do you think of this photo, Stacy? She's like, nah, it doesn't do it for me. What do you mean it doesn't do it for me? <laughs> you know? And you need to listen to that. You know, I, yes. David Archer, yeah. my first time visiting David's house for a South Carolina workshop, beautiful photo of, of a maelstrom in, uh, on the big island of Kauai up over the dining room table. But, you know, uh, Paula wasn't a big fan of it, right? Yeah. Wrong color. <laughs> It was the wrong <laughs> color for the room. Yeah. I remember it was beautiful. And, and I could, and then the next time I came, there it was in the guest room <laughs> over the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it looks yeah, beautiful in both places, David, but it's just yeah. funny. You know, you, you have to, it's sometimes it, you have to exactly, you have to divorce yourself from the, the ordeal that you went through and the memory of creating the image and how important it was. And that, you know, I mean, it needs to appeal to other people. Yeah. I, I, I have a, an exercise that I'm actually just about to start. It's December, every December and into January, I go back into my catalog and I pick a year and I go through all the images from that year. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing process. I find a lot that I actually go in and delete. I mean, I just get rid of them. Um, I find images that, that I go, wow, this is actually kind of interesting. I, I don't know why I didn't recognize it at the time. And I find a lot of photographs that I did back then that still appeal to me, but I reprocess them because, mm -hmm. you know, I use too much glow. I, you know, I was the king of glow back in 2008, 2010, um, you know, and, and I, it, it's, it's a really good practical exercise to do. Even if you don't delete anything, you don't reprocess anything. But to go through and look at your work it, over a specific period of time and just sort of one, it helps you realize that you have come somewhere as a photographer, which you know it's hard to look at sometimes. You know, it's hard to think, you know, am I am I getting any better? Um, but it's also good to see how you've changed over time and how you've changed the way you edit, you know, and that sort of thing. So I like I said, I do this every December, and I've been trying to figure out which year I'm gonna do um. I'm probably going to do a, a decade ago, 2010, um, which I'm kind of afraid of because it's also got like 12,000 photos in it. So. <laughs> 2010 is a year I need to go back and revisit actually too. And I have 
yeah. tens of thousands of photos to go through. It is, it's a good, it's a really good idea. And you know, what's great about raw photographs are that, you know, 10 years ago, think of the processing software we were using and think of what we have available today. And you get to go back yeah. and look at the same raw data through a fresh set of tools, which is really Last fun. year, I found a photo that I, that I had taken at uh, the Musée d'Orsay in mm. Paris in 2008 with my wife. And, it, you know, they have this beautiful clock uh, mm. face with that, that's got that's behind glass. And I took this photograph and I could not get anything out of the shadows with it. And I looked at it last last year and I was like, hmm. And so I reprocessed the image and I was able to actually get back an unbelievable amount of detail from an old Canon 5D photo. Uh, there you go. So, it, you know, that's another sort of little surprise is, you know, some of those images that you might have that, you know, back in the day, you couldn't quite get them right. There was something, you know, there's too much noise or this or that, you know, the processing on some of those photos now can be amazing. It, it can also not be, you know, but <laughs> it's, one of, it's one of the nice surprises of that. So, I, you know, someone asked, the other thing that, the other thing that's funny about that exercise is I often find myself culling the images completely differently. I find, I find yes. images that I passed over that I just love now. Yes. And yeah, it's so interesting. It's so interesting yeah. how that works. Oh. It's funny how I discovered focus at some point, you know? <laughs> 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 My photos from like 2001 to 2007, you know, there's like a hundred in each year now because I've gone through and gotten rid of all the ones that were out. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I need to do that. <laughs> uh, right. Let's see. Um, there were a couple of questions about people are having difficulties with processing multi-row panos in Lightroom on their computers, um, yeah. and mostly it was, you know, is there anything special that needs to be done with multi-rows and? Do you have thoughts for how to sort of help people with sort of large, complex, multi-row panos, getting them processed? Do you process a row at a time and then try and stitch separate panos together? I think there's a couple of a couple of points to make about that. First, you know, given that you know, I saw some of the questions were about, say, Nikon Z7 or Sony A7R4 files, where you know you're working with 46 or 64 megapixels to begin with, um, and and I think, you know, potentially instead of throwing a 50 millimeter lens on and doing three rows of 10 images at you know that high a level of resolution you might consider leaving the 24 on there and just doing five overlapping images to capture the whole scene because you're gonna still have a lot of resolution. Uh, you know, unless, unless you're printing something the size of a building, if you have some real special need for printing something just enormous, because I have great prints in my house at 24 by 36 from my old D700 that were 12 megapixel single, single frame images. So, I mean, as long as you capture a sharp image you don't necessarily need it to be 500 megapixels. Um, now, if you do have a need to render a huge panorama, ultra high resolution, um, you know, we've talked a little bit before about the fact that when we talked a lot in our panorama project that we did recently, there's a number of folks from the panorama project in the room here that uh, using Photoshop and assigning in Photoshop's preferences a fast, maybe SSD external scratch drive where all it does is writes virtual memory to that little drive once the computer runs out of RAM can really help with assembling big panoramas. And you may find that Photoshop doesn't stumble where Lightroom does because Lightroom, you know, essentially Lightroom can fill up your system drive with data that it's caching because it's run out of RAM and then everything just crashes because there's no place to put the data as it's building this huge thing. Um, and so, you know, one option is to just add a scratch drive and use an external um, drive for that and, you know, use, use, use Photoshop. The second option is to merge each row 
and then merge the rows. So it's going to, you know, in, 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 you're going to have a flattened smaller file. It's, it's, it's going to take it a lot of processing power to build that row and then it'll save it and cache it away and do that with all three rows and then just blend those three rows as if it was a panorama. So you can do it in pieces. It's a long and, and painstaking process though. Any thoughts on, uh, on that, Rick? No, I, I think one of the things that, that we see is people who want to do that are working on a, a machine that doesn't have enough RAM in it. That's a that's the big thing. Um, I mean, if you're going to be doing multi-row panos, you, 16 gigabytes, you're going to run out of quick and it's going to end up going to a, a drive-based cache file. Um, yep. You know, uh, I know, you know, we had one person in the Pano project who went from uh, 16 gigabytes to 64 gigabytes in their iMac over the course of the, the project and was amazed at just the, the, the difference in being able to process those panos. Um, and I, I, I completely agree. I mean, the, the smartest investment that I've made hardware wise in the last few years has been these SSDs. Um, you know, every once in a while, Amazon will have, you know, the uh, Samsung T7s on, on sale. Um, I just actually bought three of them to upgrade from my old T3s and T5s, but you don't need a big one. 500 gigabytes is more than enough for a dedicated cache drive. And that yeah. I think you'll find will help quite a bit too, you know. I have two of these T7s in my hand and I have links for those in my ATS link site. And, and one is one terabyte, one's two terabytes. And if I put my Lightroom catalog on that one terabyte drive and my files on the two terabyte drive, everything speeds up so much. Yeah. And you can tell Photoshop to run its external cache to say the one that has the, the Lightroom catalog on it. Photoshop and Lightroom are gonna be writing at the same time. So Photoshop could write virtual memory as it runs out of RAM to that same drive you have set up as your catalog file for Lightroom and everything's gonna work faster and smoother. If yeah. your operating system is on your computer's drive, your catalog is on a fast SSD and your data is on another fast SSD, your laptop's gonna scream compared to what you're used to. Yeah, um, and the same thing's um, true of your desktop. And my desktop, I actually have an internal drive set up just to be scratch. It's a small 500 gigabyte drive that all it does is the different programs that I have that I can assign a scratch drive to, my video editing software, my Adobe Premiere and, and Photoshop, and on one, all write their cache files to that drive. And that's all that drives for. It has a separate channel for the computer to to yeah. offload excess memory to. Um, we have one other sort of panel related question from Norman um, about suggestions for eliminating distortion from a panos built with a 14 to 24 millimeter lens um, multi mm -hmm. and multi-row stuff. And we've talked about this in the past as well. So. We have. The, the greatest thing you can do for ultra wide angle panoramas is shoot them way wider than you would necessarily think you should. Start far to the left, maybe have the first thing that's of interest to you all the way on the right side of the frame. End way to the right with the last thing that's of possible interest to you way on the left side of the frame. You know, Go wider than you think you need to. Make sure you've got more sky in there than you think you need, more foreground in there than you think you need, and then crop into it because that way, the panorama engine is going to be able to use only the center sweet projection part of the lens for the whole scene that's important to you. And that center part has less distortion and it's just going to be cleaner. And you're going to find that most of the distortion is on the edges. Now that can change if you're doing 180 degrees or 360 degree panorama. You know, Ron had a great panorama from Santa Barbara where there were all these different pathways from a from a, a fountain or a, a pond or a kind of a sculpture with buildings all the way around. And there's going to be distortion. You know, if you've got a, a pathway going this way and that way, they're going to, they're going to look like V's. I mean, there's no way to render all 360 degrees of the world on a flat piece of paper. That's something map makers have been struggling with, you know, from time immemorial, you'll wind up with Alaska looking like it's this tiny little thing in Antarctica looking like it's bigger than all of Asia. You know, so you have to make decisions about where there's distortion 
And the software does a good job of that, but it's gonna mostly be relegated to the edges. So just remember that and make sure that you go wider than you need so you can crop into the part that's less distorted and more important to you. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one more question that'll probably take a longer answer. Um, Jim asked, does you have a lot of cool gear opening a variety of shooting options? If you were forced to travel with one body, one lens, and one tripod to a new wild landscape, landscape location, what would you take and why, and how would that change for street photography? I know you love this question. Wow, that's a that's a painful one for me. Um, I, I have never, I don't think I've ever traveled with just one lens. I, that's, that's just a tough one. I, I don't think I have. No, I, you know, it, I'll give, I'll give you my three lens answer. <laughs> my, my three lens Woody's answer, answer is, is just take your phone. It, it looks like, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> my three lens. I mean, if I'm going to a crazy new landscape, I'm going to have a, a 14 to 24, and a 70 to 200 and a 50. Um, but if I had to go really light, you know, all in when this. I go, huh? All yeah. in this. Yeah, or all my little backpack. I mean, things are smaller yeah. than they used to be. Uh, if, if, if I'm if I'm really relegated to going light, let's say I'm winter ski mountaineering, I'm probably going to take the little 24 to 70 f4, and I'm gonna uh, gonna use panoramas to get wider angles, uh, and hope I don't run into the most amazing long lens needed seen because I can't shoot it you know I'd take the and I'd take the z7 because it's got more megapixels so I can crop if I need to um, but it it's it's tough you know I if I had to do that very much I might consider investing in that 24 to 200 millimeter uh, variable aperture lens that Nikon just came out with because it is pretty good and I think some of those all-in ones are getting better than they used to be but there are a lot of compromises still made so it's yeah it's, that's a, a tough call for me. I'm, I'm a person who I love the ultra wide and I love the really long. <laughs> so for me, I, I've actually the, the little 24 to 70 F4 is the first 24 to 70 I've ever carried because I, I tend to just use a couple primes in there that are lighter and cheaper and yeah. usually better quality anyway. Um, so um, yeah, and the, yeah. you know, like the phone. What do you think, Rick? Uh, uh it, it's hard to make that decision. Um, you know, I, I would probably go, <clears throat> you know, I'm a Sony guy and I would probably still end up with three lenses, <clears throat> you know, 16 to 35, food. the 100 to 400 and probably a prime in the middle of that. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if I have to go, I would probably take the, you know, the best zoom I have. And, you know, like, like you say, you know, hope that you don't get in a situation where you want ultra wide or not. Um, you know, so. let's torture David for a second. Yeah, yeah, I'm, David, I'm kind of the don't wrong go. guy. <laughs> <laughs> David usually shows up with like four check bags full of camera gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the wrong guy yeah, for this Kimball. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what would you take if you had to take one camera and one lens it depends on what kind of trip it is if it's a well, bird trip you know <laughs> that's a totally different answer than if it's yeah. a landscape trip well i think yeah. they said to to a beautiful new landscape yeah have to have to go with the the holy trinity three <laughs> yeah yeah. All right. Sorry, Again, Jim. I don't think we. I don't think we're really helpful on that. <laughs> that, no. that question. Sounds like the uh, wrong focus group. Yeah. Well, we're, you know, I understand it. I, I definitely understand it. And there's lots of times when I go somewhere and I put, you know, a twenty-four, a fifty-five, and you know, a seventy to two hundred with me. You know, and the biggest lens out of that group is the seventy to two hundred. Um, well. You know what? I actually, I think I can't, I, I, we did the first pandemic sort of photo gallery shoot where everybody submitted images and I mm -hmm. went out and, and all I carried was my little Nikon 
uh, Z50 with the 16 to 50 pancake lens because it's tiny and I can, it's the equivalent of 24 to 70 and I could shoot panos, which I did if I, if I find something of interest. I think, you know, I'm, I'm probably more likely if I'm taking one camera and one lens and I really can't carry much else, I'd probably take my ultra lightweight little four pound pan and tilt uh, Acrotech head on that, on that set of Leo photo legs that I love, that little lightweight thing. And that Z50 with the 16 to, to 50, because yeah. it really weighs almost nothing and it's small and it can fit in my coat pocket. Um, if I'm taking a serious camera out, I want the lenses to take advantage of it. Yeah. And I think the other thing is the way that I would probably think about the question would be, what are the lenses that I have that I know in and out that will get me the images that I want to get? Yeah. You know, um, you know, don't take a 24 to 70 if you've never shot with it and you don't know what its capabilities are. You know, take yeah. take the, the lenses that you're comfortable with. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I've loved about the Sony is, you know, the, you know I've got a 35, a 20, 20, a 28, and a 55 that are all tiny. I mean, they're all small and they're great glass. You know, and it's like I can put those four lenses in a small bag and walk around with my body and it's, and it's great so i mean you know think about the glass you got what you're trying to what you're trying to get on your trip and yeah. think of it that way you know um i think we're kind of at, at at the end of our time this week sad to say it's been great to see everybody judith it's really nice to see you too i'm glad you joined today yeah i haven't seen you guys in too long well, all right, everybody. It's been great seeing you. And in a couple of weeks, submit some images. You know, let's yeah. uh, let's look through and see what people are are thinking right now in this crazy, weird holiday system season. And everybody, hang in there and be safe and yeah. keep creating. And and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Darren and David and Woody and Rick. You guys rock.